Okay, so I'm going to start off, um, first of all, thanking Dale for his wonderful series. Um, and I know Eleanor is going to tell us a little bit about biospheres earlier, but I want to tell you a little bit about how this series came about. Um, we are hosting a tri-biosphere series, um, and that's with the Kerry Biosphere and the Isle of Man Biosphere. And we're looking at um, the wonder and beauty of our, our various biospheres. And during our first biosphere, we had a young person who was in the webinar and they said, um, they really enjoyed it. And is there anything that we could do for young people? And so the answer was absolutely always, obviously, yes, we wanna work and engage with young people. And um, so we set up this webinar series. Um, and that's all because of you guys uh, showing an interest in what we're doing. So I know Eleanor's itching to get on and tell you a little bit about what biospheres are and how they work. So um, Eleanor, I'm gonna pass over to you. Fantastic, thanks Dean. I'm just gonna share my presentation here to remember how to do it and get it up on the main screen for you. Is that sharing full screen now? Fantastic, yeah. Perfect. Perfect. So welcome to, to our webinar today. Just a little reminder that your cameras and your microphones are automatically turned off and muted. If you have any questions, put them in the Q&A box and we'll try and get to them at the end of Dale's presentation. So I'm going to run through a very quick introduction to what biosphere reserves are. So they're part of the UNESCO program. And they're places where um, nature and culture interact. So there, there's always an element of nature conservation, but it's not just about the nature conservation. It's always also about how people interact with nature and how we can do that in an environmentally responsible and sustainable way. So that includes looking at how we live in the area, how we farm the land, how our businesses operate, and how we use those places for recreation or enjoyment and well-being. So as I said, it's where nature and culture interact. Now, I said it's part of a UNESCO program. So the word UNESCO actually stands for United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization. And their motto is building peace through international cooperation in education, the sciences and the culture, which ties in with the work that myself and Dean are doing in the Dublin Bay and the Kerry Biospheres. Now, biosphere reserves are made up of three areas. So as I said, there's always an element of nature conservation. So that's really in the core area, and that's always a protected area. Around that, we have what we call the buffer zone. This is where we start seeing people using the land in an environmentally sustainable way. And then outside of that is the transition area, which usually has, like for in Dublin, for example, has the capital city, so has a huge population living there. And in Kerry, we have Killarney as our biggest town. So there you start to see a lot of the businesses and livelihoods being made there. So where are the biosphere reserves? Worldwide, there's 714. In Europe and North America, there's just over 300. But in Ireland, we only have two. So there's the Dublin Bay over on the East Coast, and there's the Kerry Biosphere Reserve on the Southwest. So Dublin Bay generally is in this location here. They have some amazing maps. So you can check out their website. It's dublinbaybiosphere.ie and you can see a lot more details. They've got some really lovely videos. You can see the seal behind Dean is in some of the videos as well. So amazing information on their website to check out. And it, this map here shows you a little bit about how the area is used. So you can see there's areas of nature conservation like Bull Island, and then there's also businesses like Dublin Port operating. And in Kerry, our biosphere is actually a landlocked biosphere. So it's right in the middle here and covers some of the McGillicuddy Reeks and the areas around there. So here's a map of the Kerry Biosphere Reserve. The red section in the center is the core area. Now that's actually the same area as Killarney National Park, which is one of Ireland's oldest national parks. And that area is protected for nature conservation for several different species and habitats. We also have then the buffer zone, which is that orangey color. And that's part of the McGillicuddy Reeks and the Paps Mountain Range over on the east. And then outside of that in the green zone is what we call the transition area. And you can see we've got a lot of our towns and villages in that area. So I'm gonna hand over to Dale, who's going to be teaching us today all about trees, plants, and bugs. So I'll, over to you, Dale, I'll stop sharing. Boys and girls and teachers, how are you? Welcome back to our final in our series of four home schooling webinars. And of course, when we started this, many of you were still homeschooling. Hopefully today, most, if not all of you, are back in school for the last day of your school term. I know many of you will be heading home for a wonderful Easter holiday break where hopefully we get lots of lovely weather so we can go for loads of walks 
in to begin with within our five kilometers, but hopefully a little bit later in the Easter, we might be able to go back a little bit further as well. Now, boys and girls, for those who take note, this week is tree week. So I'm going to be showing you lots of things to do with trees. Now, I've got a couple of things which I'm going to put up to show you, which I've collected over the years. This. Well, actually, you know what? I'm not going to tell you what this is. I'm going to see if folks can put in the chat and guess what it is. And back when it comes to question time, at the very end, we'll see who was correct. So that's an interesting bit of timber. Another bit of timber I'm going to show you, which again will get folks to put in the chat if they can figure out what it is and why it is. It's all twisted and now Can we see that mad shape? So again, we'll let teachers take note of what um, children think, put it in the chat, and at the very end, at question time, I'll come back and I'll tell you what those two bits of timber are. But to kick things off, I want to share a screen with you all. Because it's National Tree Week, this is a photograph of my boy, Nathan, with his grandfather from Australia. Now, obviously this is a couple of tree weeks ago when we are allowed to travel and they're planting the tree in our garden. It's actually a redwood, which is one of the tallest trees in the world. They're from North America, from California specifically. And I know many of you this week, it's been a lovely week for many families. For the first time in a long time, folks have been able to visit some of their nanas and granddads in care homes. And in the next week, hopefully we'll all be able to visit our nanas and granddads. And when we get to do so, maybe something which would be lovely to do would be to plant a tree in our gardens. Anyway, we're gonna stop the share because as well as trees and things, I've got lots of cool things to show you all about trees. I'm gonna do a little bit of tree ID at this time of year. I also said we're gonna do stuff on bugs. We're gonna go for a bit of a bug hunt. So we're gonna start by going for a virtual bug hunt from my backyard from last summer which was part of National Play Day. And we're going to come back and we're going to look at some bugs on the visualizer, which I found just this morning. Boys and girls, how are you? Welcome to National Play Day. My name's Dale and this is my son, Nathan. Hello. Today, we're going on a bug hunt. To do our bug hunt, we need a couple of things to take with us. We're taking some nets, is that right, Nathan? Yes. We've got a little container that we can catch things in, and we've also a white sheet. And we're gonna be looking for bugs in the air, on the ground, in the water, and in trees. Let's go on a bug hunt. places to look for insects on the ground. Nathan, if we look at things like old logs, so we can pull, pull them over like that, or we can look at old underneath old stones. So I'll give this a push, make sure that you keep your fingies away, and we'll see what sort of things we can find. Wow, look at all those bugs. Excellent, so I'm gonna catch a couple and make sure that this doesn't fall on our fingers. <gasps> That'd be no good, would it? There we go, grab it, grab it, all right. So mate, what we've done, we've caught a couple of things like woodlouse, 
and have a look in here we've also got a centipede and we've a pill bug and we've also oh, I think what we got? Um. yeah we've got some ants as well so what we're going to do Nathan we're going to pop them in these little things called bug viewers so you can have a closer look now bug viewers are really really cool and they'd be an excellent thing for parents to get for summer to catch things in so here we go pop him in have a look how many legs have you got? I'll give you a hint, count one side. Seven. Seven. So we times that by two? Fourteen. Okay, so that's a woodlouse. So here's a kind of crustacea. If it's got six legs, it's an insect. If it's got eight legs, that's an arachnid like a spider. Well done, Nathan. Should we look at some of them close up? down here in another part of our woods where there are loads of trees lots of different species of trees we're going to do a little activity which is called insects and trees and to do this I've laid down a big white sheet now it could be something like a white sheet like this it could be a big bit of tarp or it could even be an umbrella and what I'm going to do Nathan is I'm going to shake all the leaves I'm going to see what falls down and you've a little magnifying viewer there because many of these bugs might be really really small and you're going to see what they look like are you ready yeah. all right to do this buddy I need you to lower your eyes so you don't get any bugs or dirt in your eyes, okay? Well, I grab all the leaves and I shake. Right, come and have a look. Let's see what's here. That's Can you cool. see him? Yeah. That's a wee little spider. He's tiny, so you're going to have to look at him real, real close. And there's a little leaf hopper. See him? Yeah. yeah. Excellent. And another little spider there. Now, something else we can do, Nathan, is we can be looking through the long grass with our nets. And to do that, we just have to swish like so and see what we can find. So swish away. Excellent stuff. Now, let's see what we got. Out. There's wee little moths, little flies, cool stuff. What's this? That's a little le 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 leaf hopper. He's tiny, look at him. Now, Nathan, buddy, this is our pond. In our pond, we've loads of different things. Over the years, we've caught frogs and newts. And we can try to catch lots of different pond bugs too. So if you dip your net down into the water, bring it up for me, and I'll see if I've got anything in it. There is a little pond bug in that one. So what we'll do, is we'll lift him out of there. We don't want to. We'll pop him into the water, and we'll have a look at him. So shall we? Do you want to dip again for me? Try one more time. Ah, oh, excellent. Good work. There's loads of things in this one which we can go through and find. and loads of insects in the air Nathan things like butterflies and bees and hoverflies and we've even got our little bee hotel beside us for the solitary bees to have homes in boys and girls I like to not 
catch our butterflies and bees, I like to sit and watch them and see them doing their role, which is pollinating, taking pollen from one flower to another one so that we have nuts, fruits, berries, and other crops. Can you see that one there, Nathan? Yeah. And of course, boys and girls, we finished off with my pollinated area, which is right behind me here on my big screen. Now, I went out this morning and I caught you a few things that I put in my bug view. Now, it's very hard to see the bug viewers like this way. So I'm gonna try something a little clever. I've got a new trick up my sleeve. I'm gonna give ourselves a, another screen share onto my camera setting. And there we go. There's a bug view. Now, I've gotta bring my bug view closer to the camera. And I'm wondering, can anybody make out that that's a bumblebee? Now, it's not moving, which makes my life a little bit easier because I was going through some old pots yesterday looking for some spiders and things, and I found this bumblebee, which perhaps is left over from last summer. Remember, not all bees live all the way through. Now, I think somebody asked me about bumblebees and how what's the fastest bumblebee last week and i kind of mentioned that it's surprising that bumblebees can fly at all aerodynamically they don't look like they would see so they're big and heavy and furry and that's to catch lots of pollen when um to take with them back so to feed the larvae and a like but there you go bumblebees are cool yeah now i do have some things which are moving which would be a lot of fun when we get to see them so i'll see if i can get one into the middle of one of my bug viewers. Aha! We can make that one out. It's got loads of legs, doesn't it? Its legs come out in pairs. And it's got between three and four hundred legs. Well, that didn't get it to the middle. I'll see if I can get it to the middle again. There we go. It's a millipede. A millipede that decomposes the rotting bark moths and stuff like that. Let's see what else we got. Uh, two for the price of one in this one. I'm hoping you get to see them. Oh. There's a woodlouse. 14 legs. He's upside down at the moment, I think. He's a crustaceous, so he's related to crabs and prawns. There is another millipede in there somewhere, another species of millipede, but um, doesn't seem to be that visually seems to be hiding in a corner, doesn't he? Ah, oh, there we go. You can see him there. He's brown in colour. See that? Cool, cool. So hopefully, next time around we'll get to do a little bit more of a bug hunt and we'll get to come and see it very, very soon. Now, I've got a whole lot of things which I'm going to put on the, my camera in a minute to do with trees, because I want to do a little bit of tree ID work. But before we do tree ID work, so we better give you an introduction as to what trees are great to plant around the school garden. And I believe this actually got posted this week um, from Dean's old stomping ground, Dunleary Rath Down for school, see what's best to plant in their school garden. Now, boys and girls, our bats and our birds, of course, do even better when there's lots of mature trees. Now, at this time of year, I'd normally be coming out to see you for tree week, and we'd be planting trees from my tree nursery. Unfortunately, we're not gonna get to plant them out this year, but I might get to see you very soon to plant trees in your school garden. But I thought what I'd do, so I'll tell you about some of the different trees which I'm growing and how you can grow them yourself this seed collection season. This here, this is Rowan. Rowan is one of my favourite trees to plant in schools because the trees don't become too big in the school gardens. They have wonderful white flowers which flower in around the month of May and then all summer long there's berries and these berries feed the songbirds like thrushes and blackbirds. You can always tell Rowan by looking at its leaves. It has what we call a compound leaf, which is one leaf made up of many leaflets. To 
propagate the seeds, what you need to do is crush the berries and macerate and get the seeds out and then sow them in light compost. This one is oak. Now this is actually the red oak, which is from North America, not from Ireland at all. And in the autumn, its foliage goes really, really crimson and red. But in Ireland, we've two kinds of oak. We've the uh, Irish oak, which grows to the west, and we've the, what we call the English oak, which actually is, grows in Ireland as well, which grows on the east side of the country. And for growing oak trees, we collect acorns in much the way that the squirrels do, and they stockpile them, and we can sow them straight in the compost to grow our own oak trees in the autumn and winter months for planting out next year. Another one of my favorite trees for school gardens is the Scots pine. Scots pine are evergreen. That means that they keep their leaves all year long and they make one of the most prettiest trees to see over the winter periods and they provide food for red squirrels. Another tree I like planting out in schools is this. This is cherry. Cherry is fantastic. And at this time of year, you'd be getting, well, you won't be getting them now, but in the summer months, you'll be getting cherries, which are really yummy to eat. But they also provide lots of food for native songbirds. And last but not least, what are we going to show you? <gasps> Hazel, which is actually what the mature tree here is. Hazel is a fantastic tree for growing in schools because it doesn't get too big. It has a large, simple leaf, we see that, which is roundish in shape, and it's kind of a bit furry, and it has loads of hazelnuts, which we can eat, but also provide food for squirrels and other creatures in the autumn and winter. Guys, enjoy your tree planting. We'll see you then. Now, boys and girls, I went out as I always do, and I caught a hot, put a whole lot of things in my magic hat. And the magic hat is a little bit like a story we used to tell many years ago called the magic pudding. It just keeps growing and growing and there seems to be more and more things in the magic hat. It's full of loads of cones and leaves. And what we're going to do is we're going to put some of these cones and leaves in my visualizer I will get to identify them. So what I'm going to do first of all is put on different screen share stuff. The first screen share I want to put on is something called a key. You can see that there. It's a leaf key of different leaves, which we find here in Ireland of different trees. Now see if you can visualize and memory some of those ones. Now, at this time of year, we don't find all the trees with leaves on them. It's a little bit different, of course, because it's the spring. And in early spring, a lot of trees are just starting to bud. But I'll close this one off and we'll come back to our screen share again with my visualizer. I've changed settings on the visualizer, so hopefully you'll be able to see things a bit better. Now, one of the things I collected when I was outside was this. It's a cone, isn't it? Now, it's a cone of a tree we find here in Ireland called a Scots pine. Scots pine are evergreen. So at this time of the year, it still has green leaves. Now, our Scots pine leaves are long and pinnate. And because of that, they don't get affected by frost. That's why they're evergreen. And they're always over seven centimetres long. So it's a great way to identify Scots pine. But I think I mentioned previously that the seeds of Scots pine are really, really good because they're very fine. And red squirrels eat the seeds of Scots pine. And earlier this year, I was doing some things for Science Week. Uh, back in November, and all I had to do was literally look that way, about two yards away from me, and along my windowsill, I used to see a red squirrel running up and down, looking for the seeds of my Scots pines, which weren't fruiting this year. Speaking of another tree, uh, which has pine cones, it, this is a tree called larch. 
Now, larch is a bit different. Larch is the only deciduous, which means it loses its mid. Conifer. So at this time of year, if we look at a larch, we'll actually see the fresh buds just starting. And this really lovely pinky colored fruity, flowering fruit is actually the larch pine cone. Now it's, but it's not a fruit because larch is a, is a conifer. So it doesn't have flowering fruit in the same way that uh, flowers which are pollinated by insects. Actually uh, being a conifer, they're pollinated by wind. So that's an interesting thing. Now, speaking of things which are pollinated by insects, and these, now I'll turn this around the other way. We see this at this time of year, this is the flower from willow. Now the flower from willow is packed with loads of pollen. So it's a great flower to have early in the season because it's full of flower for bees and our bumblebees as they start to emerge from their hibernation. Another flower which I found today, which is on the tree, Okay. Ah, here it is. It's from one of the thorn trees in my hedge. This is blackthorn or slow. There we go. And it's very early flowering as well. And you can just see just on the tips, it's just starting to bud as well. So bud means they're the leaves for this year. What other things do we have? Now, this is a telltale one. You should be able to all identify this one. This is an evergreen tree. Its leaves are green all year round because it's very tough and scoracious. Let's say you all guess that one. That's holly. Now, I did go out and found some leaves which sort of still subsist or, or are there, but they have the hiss, like this one. This is oak, of course. Now, that leaf uh, sort of uh, dehisced last autumn, but we can look at oak trees at the moment. Let's see if I can find one. There we go. If we look carefully, I'll turn it around the other way. They're the buds, which are where this year's leaves are coming from, but the buds of an oak tree, I'm going to pull it up to the top of the closer. There we go. They're quite telltale because they look a little bit like a rice crispy bun. So that's the way that I always identify oak. There's a little bit of a saying here in Ireland, isn't there, about oak and ash. And that's which ones come out first, whether we're in for a splash or whether we're in for a soak. Now, ash has a different kind of bud. The ash buds, they come out what we call oppositely, whereas the oak buds, they come out zigzag or alternately. Can you see that? Now, ash, it's got flicked over there, its buds are black in colour. Right? Sometimes you see a tree which looks very like that, but their buds are green. Well, that'll be a stick of all. Right. My desk is getting very messy at the moment. Let's see what else we have here. I had to put all these things over this direction. Ah, now these buds, they're from hazel. Okay, they're only just starting to pop now. What else we have to look at? Oh, another lot of buds which is just popping. This is birch. Now, birch at this time of year, if we look carefully as well, has these things, these are called catkins. And catkins. They're going to be the flowers producing more birch seeds next year as well. What else have we got? Ah, another tree which has catkins at the moment is alder. You can see our catkin there. And actually, if we look carefully, we might see some pollen grains on it. Now, alder, the buds of alder. A zigzag, okay, and they are on little stalks. It's always a telltale thing for older. Another thorn, which is just starting to bud at the moment. 
makes is white thorn or hawthorn. It's also called the Mayflower because we're more likely to see a flower in May. Oh, back to our alder again. Sorry, I thought later in the year, alder, alder might still have some of these on. This is last year's cones from the alder. If I tap, oh no, I tapped it the other day. I was doing something on trees. Oh, there we go. There's one. Here's a wee seed. It's tiny. Now, alder seeds are dispersed by wind and water. They're very small and light. What else we got? This is beach. Beach. And leaves, which sometimes that's why people often use beech and hedges because the leaves are still there, even though they're dehissed. But the buds of the beech, we'll see the bud there, they're very long, they're elongated, and they're very, um, if you like, smooth to touch. It's always a good giveaway when identifying the beech. Wow, what a mess my desk is. I'm going to have to clean it up before Miss Treadwell comes back from Dorky this afternoon. She won't be very happy at all. <gasps> Now, so boys and girls, we've done loads of cool stuff on bugs and on trees. But I know I've been promising ever since I started that on the final episode, I would have a very special surprise for you. Our special surprise is going to be from a trip to my garden last November, which was taken by a friend of mine called Dr. Dan Nickerstrom. Dr. Dan has a whole series called Science at Home. And I think he's up to 22 now. And it's really good to watch. But this particular trip, <gasps> he came across plants and animals from 100 million years ago. <laughs> So I'm here with Dino Dale and I'm going to learn all about dinosaurs because uh, I should really learn all about dinosaurs. Thanks for having us Dale. Dan, you're very very welcome. Welcome to the Gumtree Cottage. The Gumtree Cottage. Well, a few questions first, Dale. So I was always really into dinosaurs when I was a kid. I collected dinosaur magazines and I had these dinosaur skeletons I used to build, but I've forgotten almost everything I used to know about dinosaurs. So a, a couple of questions first. We all are familiar with like T-Rex and I would also know Stegosaurus and Brachiosaurus. Did they exist together at the same time and place. Now, when we see the movies like Jurassic World and Jurassic Park, we get the impression that all these dinosaurs were around at the same time. That's not the case. Dinosaurs existed on Earth over a number of hundreds of millions of years, and they were in different time periods. Um, the last of the dinosaurs we believe became extinct around 66 million years ago, but most of the dinosaurs, which we find and see the, the, the exciting ones, I suppose, are from the Cretaceous period, and that's about oh, yeah. 100 million years back. But then we have other periods where we go back even further into the Jurassic and the like, and different dinosaurs exist at different periods so it's not always the case that the same dinosaurs we see in the movies are actually at the same time and they many of them existed in different parts of the world okay and another thing I like I've never seen a dinosaur in real life um, but I've heard that dinosaurs might have had feathers now we're starting to believe that dinosaurs evolved, for particularly theropod dinosaurs, may have evolved into modern day birds. And if we look at things like this, this is a bone of a large flightless bird from Australia. This is a bone of an emu. Okay. Now this emu, of course, has feathers, but if we look very closely at large flightless birds like emus and yeah. cassowaries, we can see a very strong resemblance to what dinosaurs may have been. Yeah, yeah, it looks very dinosaur-like. It does, very it does. And for this, we're starting to change our theories with, to a lot of dinosaurs that they may have, many dinosaurs may have been covered in a down to either keep them warm yeah. if, if they lived in cooler climates, like some of the dinosaurs I might yeah, tell you about yeah. later on lived in very cool climates. And it may have been, like birds, they were colourful 
in order to attract okay. a mate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I'm seeing now a T-Rex covered in all these feathers flapping around the place, looking like it's sort of a thing, but it's probably not like that. It's probably something a bit more subtle. Maybe. Well, you know, strangely enough, some of them might have actually looked very like chickens. Okay, yeah, yeah, because actually, I ha myself and my wife keep chickens, and sometimes you hear this like, this sort of mad noise that's like a dinosaur. So I really do like feel that there's some sort of connection well, there. Well, it could have been that dinosaurs, in fact, just like the movies, we get the impression that maybe they roared like lions yeah, and tigers. Yeah, yeah. It may have been more like the sounds w which birds make okay. in their calls, but it may have been that because they were much larger, that those oscillations were deeper. But it may well be that dinosaurs actually sounded more like birds. And I've yeah. heard footage where we've slowed down the um, sound of birds and and it could well be that that's exactly what dinosaurs sound like. Okay, so if I was trying to, you know, kind of uh, um, make friends with a dinosaur, hypothetically, maybe I could make some sort of bird noises, some sort of, you know, sort of try something like that. Possibly time. you could try. Depends on the dinosaur though. Okay. We might still think that you might be dinner. Okay, well, thanks for that bit of info, Dale. But you know what I'm curious about? I'd like you to teach us a little bit about what we have here, because I see some really cool stuff that looks like it's from the dinosaur period. Maybe you can take us through some of us and tell us what we see here. Absolutely, Dan. Now, I always like to start with plants, because plants are the basis of all life they're from. And in Ireland, we see this plant quite a lot. This is called a monkey puzzle tree. Monkey puzzle trees are actually from Argentina and Chile. Their name is a bit of a misnomer because there are no monkeys in Chile and Argentina to be puzzled by. In fact, the poor old monkey would probably be serrated to death by the monkey puzzle tree. The reason he's all spiky and tough like this is because these plants existed at the time of sauropod dinosaurs. And when they were just seedlings or small like this to prevent them from being eaten, this is why they were so spiky. But you've got to be careful because your hands get really cut up by them. Other plants from the time of the dinosaurs are plants like this one. This is a cycad. Cycads we normally find in really dry locations. Unlike Ireland, we find them in places like Africa and in Morocco. But this one I have to keep in a polytunnel over the winter so it doesn't get too wet. And another really cool plant, this one I really, really like. This is called the Wallamai pine. The Wallamai pine is what we call a living fossil. They are related to the monkey puzzle trees and they were only discovered in the mid 1990s in a gorge to the west of Sydney. But what's cool about this plant is that it existed at a time where there were polar winters and it has on the ends, it's thing called polar caps and that's actually to protect the new growth from, if you like, cold and frost and snow, things we don't really associate with the times of dinosaurs. Something else exciting about this plant here is this one's got seed heads. We can see them there. Uh, that's really exciting because hopefully next year I'll have some baby wallamai pines. Wow, that's fascinating, Dale. It's really cool to see plants that were actually here at the time of the dinosaurs and to imagine them interacting with them because, of course, we can't see the animals anymore. But um, what I'm really curious about is this stuff here because, like, to my untrained eye, this looks like a fossil. Dan, you're absolutely right. These are fossils. 99% of all the fossils we find are not from dinosaurs. They are marine creatures. Like this, this is an ammonite. Ammonites are mollusks, which lived in the sea over 100 million years ago. And this is a trilobite, which is even older. Trilobites were between 400 million and 150 million years ago when they became extinct. So we find, most of the time, we find fossils of marine creatures rather than dinosaurs. But occasionally we can find dinosaur fossils in the form of footprints, like these here. These are a representation of something called the Lark Quarry Dinosaur Stampede. Now, this is a tooth. It's not a real tooth. This is a replica. This is a replica of a marine reptile called Chronosaurus queenslandicus, which is one of the largest marine reptiles to ever exist. And this is a claw. But we might be meeting a dinosaur which owned that claw later on. Wow, thanks for that, Dale. That's fascinating to see all this stuff here. I'm learning loads about dinosaurs. Now, I hear you might have a couple of little dinosaurs we can meet ourselves here. It's quite possible we can meet some dinosaurs in my own garden. Okay, let's go have a look. Let's do it.
Okay, who's this guy? <laughs> Dan, this is a wee little vegetarian dinosaur oh, from yes. southern vegetarian. Australia called a Leilaniosaurus. Now, she was a polar dinosaur, and we believe that she would have lived her life at maybe six months of the year in darkness because she lived down below the South Pole. So she would have had really big eyes because she was nocturnal. But she's a parrot beak uh, yeah. for eating vegetation, so she can't hurt you. In fact, she's very friendly. That's great. And if you give her a tickle under the chin, Dan, she really likes that, and yeah. she comes in for a big, Aww. big hug. Aww, that's lovely. I like the vegetarian dinosaurs. I like the vegetarian dinosaurs. Good yeah. stuff. Nice yes. to meet you. What did you say this type of dinosaur is called? She's called a Leilaniosaurus. She was actually called after a little girl whose name was Leilania. Oh, uh, so, and she's actually one of only two dinosaur species to have a feminine gender or name. So not only is she a uh, vegetarian dinosaur, yeah. but she's also a feminist dinosaur. Good stuff. What's not to love? Yes, fantastic. Do we have anyone else we can meet? Absolutely. Wow, who's this cute little Sam, one? this is baby Mataburrosaurus. His mummy would have been the size of a double-decker bus, so he's only wee small. And what happens is that his mummy would normally be eating the leaves of tough plants like those monkey puzzle trees, and she'd chew them like this okay. and then she regurgitate them to feed it so it's oh. so dan you just got to pat a baby dinosaur which eats spew and vomit oh wow okay i think that's nice i think this one's lovely but i think i prefer the previous one and when would this dinosaur have lived now these dinosaurs existed about 100 million years ago in northern australia in a place called queensland close to an area which is now called mataburra Okay, fantastic. Well, that makes perfect sense. So, really cool. Let's meet one more dinosaur. Absolutely. Okay, hold on. Wait, wait. This one looks familiar. This one looks familiar. <laughs> Dan, this is a juvenile Australovenata. Australovenata. Australovenata, or Great Southern oh. Hunter. Okay, this one looks scary. Now, this is a juvenile. This is a juvenile, but so, uh, see, I, the danger sign is there. And look what he did to my thumb when oh I was feeding him last okay. night, Dan. <gasps> right, so, uh, okay, 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 okay. So, uh, a full-sized adult one, would that, would that eat me? Well, mummy has teeth like this, Dan, so I'd be really worried about mummy. Okay, I would, uh, okay, okay. Can I learn about this dinosaur? Maybe it would be good to learn about this dinosaur. Absolutely. Now, this dinosaur was found in a couple of locations. They found yeah. bones in a place uh, near Winton. And West actually, Winton, which is up in North Queensland. Oh, okay. And actually, the bones were found in the same dig pit as a sauropod dinosaur. But they believe that the probability this dinosaur, it, the adult version, was too small to attack the sauropod. But maybe it came across the sauropod oh. stuck in the mud, thought it'd get itself a free lunch. Uh -huh. and then it got stuck as well okay stuck in the mud okay okay interesting okay so they're not completely invulnerable i could i could all possible so you could maybe maybe run 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 through a ditch or run through a bog and you might be able to escape okay okay wow okay okay well thanks for introducing me to this one maybe you can lock this one away somewhere safe and uh, and, and and we'll move on we'll move, we'll move. <laughs> Boys and girls, I cannot recommend teachers when you come back from your uh, from your midterm break to put on an episode of Dr. Dan every day throughout the rest of the year because he's fantastic to learn everything about science because he's a physicist. So you learn all sorts of really, really cool things. Now, I know there are lots of boys and girls in the classrooms out there who didn't expect to be learning about dinosaurs but also lots of them who know a lot about dinosaurs, who know I made a mistake in that video. I admit to my mistakes. I suggested this, which is called an ammonite, was a mollusk, didn't I? <gasps> if only I knew that I'd made the mistake and was able to do a voiceover. Ammonites are cephalopods, aren't they? They're like modern day squids and octopi and cuttlefish. They're not mollusks, they're cephalopods. I believe today is the opening of a new film called Ammonite about a very famous lady called Mary Annie who did, made lots of discoveries 
safety of dinosaur fossils in the UK um, in the 1800s. She was, um, she was very famous and the leading paleontologist of her time. I believe um, one of the actresses is Saoirse Ronan. So there you go. Boys and girls, it's that time of day where we wrap it up to questions. But before we get, take any other ones, I want to see, if, Dean, you've been watching chat. Did anybody have a guess at what this bit of timber might oh, be? Dale, yeah, there were a couple of guesses that came in. One suggested it was a type of musical instrument. Another one said it was a trophy. Some said noise. maybe a tree root. Okay, good guesses. Now, yeah. this is a hard one. This is actually something called a burr, B-U-R-R. -R. Now, it's growing on a bit of hazel tin. Now, what a burr is, is like a benign tumour of the tree. So if I was to actually cut this across and shape it back, unlike most trees, you know, when they grow, there's lots of rings. It grows in a ring formation, okay, each year. Well, all the growth here is all, all over the place. Make some very nice bowls. There's been lots of wood turners who've seen this who wanted, um, but it's actually the first. So it's a benign tumor of the tree. I have it particularly for secondary schools. <laughs> some of the teachers might know one. The other bit of timber. Did anybody have any guesses on the other bit of timber? Why is well, all? Well, we think we, we we think that might have been the tree root. Somebody said they thought it might have been the tree root. Yeah. I think an emu leg as well was one of the suggestions. Emu leg. Oh, well, the emu leg was the other one. No, this isn't yeah. my emu leg. The emu video. leg has a backstory. That emu actually um, appeared on a show with Dustin Turkey many years ago. That's another another day's work. Uh, no, this one. I oh, know. I know it's a bit hard to see because of the joys of the um, sort of screen sheet or the backdrops and stuff like this. This is actually a bit of white thorn or black thorn. Could be one or the other one. And what happened, I should show the other end of it, but it's nice and straight. When it was just a sapling, okay, a baby tree, a little bit of woodbine and ivy grew around it. And trees always grow towards the sun. So that's why it got the magic twist. Cool, huh? Brilliant! There you go. Very good. So uh, if anyone has any questions, please type it in the Q&A. Um, Dale, I have, a, I have a question. Um, those dinosaurs, that they're, they're not real, are they? No, they're very realistic replicas. Realistic there. replicas. But Dan okay, did look very frightened when he was being chased by that one, didn't he? I am not surprised. Absolutely. I'm not surprised. And, um, well, that's yeah, what that, was that terrifying. Big one, that big one can be very frightening, particularly when it hasn't been fed. So, Dale, what was really interesting was, um, you know, the dinosaurs, they died out. Um, and the dinosaurs can walk around the place and fine that's fantastic great but trees trees survive millions and millions of years and they don't they're not able to move around they're basically rooted to the ground it, it's quite interesting to know that the trees are still going many trees did now again that has a lot to do with the dispersal agents of trees in the trees can pack all of their genome about them in one small seed and remember i showed you how small the seeds of the older were they were tiny but every little bit of information to grow another tree is in that seed. And because the seed can stay encapsulated for a long, long period of time, it's nice and uh, within, it, within its casing, the plants could withstand uh, periods of time and growth. And that, that's why uh, you often find on volcanic islands, which have had no vegetation, veg seeds can come in from outside and regeneration can occur all over again. So plants are fantastic. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we've got a question come in. Uh, it's from uh, third and fourth class in Newtown. Um, how long do trees keep growing for? Now, it depends on the tree. There are mm -hmm. some trees which are thousands of years old um, and um, uh, the, in, in, in various parts. And there's some trees like that Wallamai pine, which I showed you in some ways, whether they believe the Wallamai pine might actually be the place where it grows. There might be a number of, the, the, it might be just one particular, if you like, um, from one tree, they've all, all grown. So it's, it, it is in some trees grow for thousands of years. Within Ireland, 
your trees, your, your oldest trees are sort of around the three, four hundred year mark in terms of an old oak. After that, we haven't many trees much older than that. I know in the Burr Castle Demens, another Burr, as in B I R R, uh, there's a tree there which I think is around the 280 year mark. It's a huge big oak tree in the middle of Burr Demens. It's a beautiful tree. Yeah, I think oak trees top end is about three to four hundred years, isn't it? So, but other trees maybe a couple there hundred are years. Are some trees beech which trees live for really, really long some, periods yeah. of period? It's a good question, though. I mean, you know, obviously, um, some of those trees a thousand years old, they would have been around. Wow, I mean, geez, what was happening a thousand years ago? I mean, yes. In Ireland, in England, I don't know. You know, I I used to visit a tree in Australia. It was called the Ada tree. I'm not sure whether it, whether it got through the last lot of big bushfires, but the Ada tree was about 400 years old, and it had a massive circumference. It was about um, literally. Uh, if 20 or 30 children joined hand and made a big circle, that was the circumference of the age. Wow. <clears throat> Amazing. They, there's a few questions come in. Um, one from Bonnie Leonard, who would like to know, how do ladybirds get their spots? Can you tell us, Dale? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Bonnie, that's a brilliant question. Look, ladybirds have evolved. There's many different species of ladybirds here in Ireland. People often sort of... Um, Think that ladybirds they that, that maybe spots evolve every year they get more no ladybirds a particular species of ladybird will have this an amount of spots that's why they say that there'd be a, a, a five spotted ladybird a seven spotted ladybird and then 14 spotted ladybird um that's a different species those spots are actually evolved in terms of ladybird they help with camouflage in, in some ways and in other ways, they actually help other ladybirds find other ladybird species. But no, it's just, it's an evolution thing. Ladybirds have got it over many, many periods. But it doesn't just appear on them. I think there is a good book about that, though. It's a children's book which goes into that, which is, yeah. Oh, can, I, can, I, can I show? Oh, please do. Can you see this? The badge. Look at this. That's now, this is... Um, the Dublin Bay Biosphere Award. Now it's a bit like a scout badge that scouts would wear on their arm. And this uh, badge is being developed in partnership with Scouting Ireland. But any young person can earn this badge. We're gonna be actually launching a program um, towards the end of May, well, that's 20th May, uh, Nas uh, UN National Biodiversity Day, or UN Biodiversity Day, I should say. Um, and from then on, young people can earn one of these badges. Now, how do they earn these badges? Well, they need to get out and enjoy nature, a bit like yourself there, Dale, when you were exploring the garden. They need to learn a little bit about nature, what happens, how, how nature works, and then they need to do something to help protect nature. Um, now, this is obviously based in and around the Dublin Bay Biosphere, and I believe maybe, maybe, hopefully, at, at some point, there'll be a Kerry Biosphere badge, and the seal will be replaced by a red deer. Um, yes. That'd be pretty amazing. Um, but we're hoping young people and schools will be interested in getting involved in, in this little programme and um, earning themselves a Biosphere badge. OK, you don't have to be a scout. You don't have to put it on your scout uniform. You can put it on your school bag. Wouldn't that be cool to have that? For everybody, you know yeah, that I love you're, it. You're a biosphere support and a biosphere champion. Yeah. Megan that, is Dale? asking if there's a link for that. Is that for the badge, Megan? Um, you can check out the Dublin Bay Biosphere webpage. All the information will be up on there. And there'll be loads of promotion going on in the next month or so as well. So definitely follow the social media and keep an eye on the webpage and you'll hear more about that. Yeah. It will be launched for, as we said, for National or for World Biodiversity, World Biodiversity Day, Day, which is yeah. on the 29th of May. So there'll be a big fanfare about that one. And it may well be that myself and Nathan will be telling you how you can earn that badge. Yeah, so you're getting a sneak peek. Okay, so that's what that's all about. <laughs> Fantastic. Dale, I think with your dinosaurs, you've captured a lot of people's imaginations. So there's a few questions come in now about dinosaurs. So the first one is, did humans evolve from dinosaurs? And then the next one, is the ostrich the closest type of bird to dinosaurs? Okay, first one. Uh, in, a, in, in, in a nutshell, in that answer, I'll say uh, no. Um, in the dinosaurs, uh, the what what we the, in terms of what we can say of dinosaurs which exist today, uh, the the avian dinosaurs which sort of evolved into more bird-like structures. 
that have, that went to, uh, if you like, in family groupings down the line of 80s, which are birds, people are mammals. So if we're looking for more direct ancestors of people, we'd be looking at things like insectivorous animals, like shrews. For those who were watching um, the other week, or things which were like shrews, similar. So, no to that one. Second one, I would be thinking rather along the lines of rather than looking at um, uh, ostriches, is a bird which is, seems very much more in Australia called a cassowary. They seem very, very, very dinosaur like. But again, the similarities. There are lots of lots of other things which are very very different as well. In that um, dinosaurs were were reptilian, which are things like uh, uh, sort of snakes and lizards and, 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 and kind of like. But there's not a direct evolution from snakes and lizards to dinosaurs. It all gets complicated. You know what you'll have to do, boys and girls, when you get into secondary school, you'll have to come with me for a more complicated talk on evolution to the Natural History Museum because I've been known to do those before as well. Fantastic. That sounds like a great class, actually. Evolution is such an interesting subject, but there is, like you say, so many different threads to follow in it. I think it is quite complicated and very hard to explain in just one quick answer. So well done, yeah, Dale, in covering those. I actually have, have, have <laughs> all, all, all sorts of family family pictures and uh, if, if, if you like of them, um, sort of, but it's, 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 it's a good one though. So, uh, are there any spruce trees in Ireland? I'm sure there probably are, but are they native to Ireland? Now, here, here is a good question in terms of trees. Now, the, you will find spruce trees in Ireland growing now in that most of your Christmas trees that you have spruce trees. The main tree which is used for forestry in Ireland is Sitka spruce. Uh, which originates from uh, Norway and from, from, from all around uh, Scandinavia. And that's the main tree which you actually see in forestry. Now, those trees, those seeds of those trees have come from other places and that's why they're growing here. But the thing about it is that prior to the last ice age, there were many trees growing in Ireland which haven't been growing here for a long period of time. Things like redwoods and hemlocks and stuff like that could have, been growing on prior to the last ice age. The last ice age took out a lot of genetic diversity in terms of mm -hmm. Irish trees. Um, so there's a yes and a no in that one. Perfect. Um, and, the, and, and the no is that in recent times, well, in recent times pre last ice age, no. In more recent times, yes, they're growing here for forestry and for the Christmas trees and stuff like that. And but be, be behind that, prior to last ice age, there are a lot of species of trees which did grow here. Okay, in Ireland, which we, um, yeah. We've got two questions. I'm going to take these two questions before we finish off because we've only got a minute left. Yeah. So how did di dinosaurs like the Iguanodon protect themselves? And that's from Lord, the second class. Yeah. Now, the Iguanodon, like the Mataburrosaurus, um, had very sharp um, claws at the front of toes and they may have used those either to defend themselves against predatory dinosaurs, but they might have even used them in the same way uh, that you were like right and come back for, um, um, uh, for, for, for who's, who's the biggest deer to get all the girlfriends. So it's hard to tell. No, we don't know for sure. Big, big front claws, they might have used them for that. And the last question is, how many different types of dinosaurs were there? I mean, <clears throat> oh, yeah, um, so far in terms of diversity, they haven't found as many as we have in current animals, but that doesn't mean that they're not, which means that they haven't found them yet. Yeah, so we don't know. They might have died out and there might be no evidence. Of we, them, keep finding, we keep finding new dinosaurs every all year. The time. Fantastic. It's a really interesting subject. So, they, In fact, fact, they found this year there were two dinosaur bones which were classified. They found them many, many years ago, but they only just classified them, which were actually found off the, off, uh, the coast from Antrim. Yeah. So those are the first two Irish dinosaurs. Wow. Now, Dale, um, to go back to Lorcan's question there, I mean, I suppose they would have protected themselves the same way animals protect themselves today. I mean, you mentioned hedgehogs there. Um, was that in the second series? Yes, how yes. the hedgehog. Um, so, you know, they had spikes and they rode themselves into a ball. Um, some of them might have been quick um, and able to run away. So I suppose some of the dinosaurs would have been able to protect themselves in the same way animals protect themselves today. 
Yeah, many many of them had all, all sorts of different different ways of sort of the different armor dinosaurs and the like. But the iguanodon style dinosaurs, the Mataburosaurus, they didn't appear to have an awful lot of pr- pr- uh, protection. But one of the ways they did protect themselves was to live in family groups. A little oh, bit okay. of the herd thing, a little bit the same way that you find zebra and wildebeest and like will live in a big herd. So there's a safety in number. So there's a safety in number. So that and that's a tactic that's used today. So look, Dale, fantastic. we've come to the end of the show the end of the four shows have you enjoyed it it's been great crack it's been brilliant it's been lovely to see you all i'm hoping what's most important though so down the line come september october hopefully we'll get to come and see you in person and do things in your school grounds create areas like behind me to create little wildflower areas when the, the time is right to do tree planting or i'd have trees to bring into classes and we'll work things along the themes of the year. So hopefully, hopefully. September, October, November of next year, I'll all get to see you live in person. That'd be amazing. And uh, I'm sure you've got a lot of new f- uh, friends and a, new, a lot of new fans. So um, we look forward to seeing you back in schools. Um, thank you, Dale and Eleanor. Thank you so much for hosting these webinar series and for your presentations at the start. Um, yep, we're going to be hosting another series in May. And if you have any ideas for that, well, do get in contact with us. We'd like to hear your ideas, but uh, we've got one or two already uh, in the irons. Um, but, you know, if you have some particular subjects that you'd like to hear about, then do share them with us. We'd, uh, we'd like to hear from you. Okay. Thanks, everybody.